Good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining. Today I've got a wonderful storytelling guest with a rich history of aviation, of all things testing, of uh, teaching, of uh, experimental flying, of warbirds, uh, military. He's got airline experience too. Please stay with me. This is going to be a fun conversation. It's going to be lots of fun about all things airplanes and getting stuck in with nice stories. Dave Southwood, experimental test pilot tutor, has been teaching test pilots for nearly three decades. He's been a test, an experimental test pilot for nearly four decades now, and he's just a wonderful man. So uh, please stay with me on the show. My name's Alex MacPhail, and this is High Performance Teams. Good afternoon to you, Dave. How are you today? Oh, tell me I've lost your sound. Hang on, let me just check. I can't hear you. Can you still hear me? Let me just see what's happening. Okay, doc. Let's just go here. Let's see what's happening to the sound. Dave. Uh, can you hear me now? Dave, I see there's a, it's muted on your side on Skype. I wonder if you can just have a look there for a sec. So we were just, uh, folks, we just had a bit of a technical glitch. While Dave's getting his sound sorted out, Please remember, you can just sign into your YouTube channel. You can use the Gmail account to sign in. That's very easy. And once you sign in, you can subscribe to the show. And this is interactive. I know that a lot of times the, the show continues. Uh, but you please post your questions. I'm reading them as they come through. And I uh, have a... Oh, there, I hear you now, Dave. Let's just go uh, cross over to Dave. Post your questions. And if you have a, a very interesting question, I'm going to get to it. I won't get to everything, but uh, let's see what you can do by grabbing my attention. Dave, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for joining us today. I believe you just got back from a flight. I did in uh, DA42, and it was um, a sort of recurrency ride for somebody. But we've had brilliant clear blue skies for a long time in the UK, and today it's cloud and rain. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, Dave, let's, uh, let's peel back the time because we've got some wonderful things to discuss about. But let's just go back to sort of formative years, uh, maybe high school or, or as a youth, where you started thinking about flying. Where did this idea about becoming a pilot begin for you and then you're leading you to joining the RAF? Yeah, I mean, I have no idea. There was no aviation or military background in the family at all. But I've got some old Ian Allen aircraft annuals from when I was about seven years old, which I had as Christmas present. So obviously the interest was there then. And it just grew and grew and grew. And then at school at the age of 13, I joined the Combined Cadet Force. And that was the big focus for the sort of last five years of my life at school. And that was where the interest really came. So probably by the time I was 13, I decided I want to fly in the RAF. By the time I was 15, I was telling my parents and everybody else. Um, with the Cadet Force, started gliding when I was 16, powered flying, um, first went solo just after my 17th birthday. Um, applied to the RAF for a university cadetship and fortunately was granted one. And the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> okay, well, it sounds like quite a, a sort of a typical uh, sort of RAF career to get in. Uh, but uh, talk us through those days. So you qualify as a, a, an RAF pilot and, and straight on to fighters? Yeah, so I went through um, sponsorship at university on a degree with aeronautics and astronautics. And as members of the university air squadrons are flying chipmunks and bulldogs. Then RAF flying training, jet provost, hawk, hunter, then on to the buccaneer as one of the prime strike attack airplanes at the time. I did a five-year frontline tour on buccaneers, um, both as overland strike attack in Europe uh, and then maritime strike attack uh, with an operational tour thrown in with the war in Beirut in 83, 84, um, plus a display season and weapons instructor course. So I managed to cram a lot into the first five-year tour that I did. Okay, there's a nice shot that you shared with me of the buccaneer. That's a, that's a real classic buccaneer shot where you get those uh, the vapor trails coming over the wings. Is there any sort of special moments about flying bucks? I know you've got a lot of experience with bucks, and it's, uh, we had them in the South African Air Force too, and now we see them as gate guards. But anything special that stands out for you about a buccaneer? Um, I think it was one of these airplanes that had fantastic flying qualities for flying low-level, high speed, but at low speed and in the landing pattern. It was a handful, and it's probably got just about the worst flying qualities and landing pattern of anything I've ever <laughs> flown, with the possible exception of the C2 Greyhound. I'd have to fly them back to back to say which was the worst. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, we're going to get to that kind of thing about your pedigree of flying. I know you've got, is it more than 200 types now? I mean, you, you can rattle uh, off these names. 
It's about 150, but it depends on how you define a type. So I'll never put a hard number on it. Okay. All right. So what makes it, I mean, I'm interested because Buccaneer is one of those iconic aircraft that I've always just looked up to and obviously never flown. But what makes it such a difficult thing to land? What's it, what sort of, what are you feeling or why is it tricky? One of the things is in the landing pattern, you had a boundary layer control system, bleeding air over the winding edges, the flaps and the tailplane. So that took a lot of power off the engine. Um, so you needed a high power setting, which then keep the speed back. You put the speed brakes out um, and they were in the jet flux. So directionally, it was pretty weak. Um, and with the drooped ailerons, monstrous adverse yaw. So just keeping the thing going, pointing in a straight line wasn't the easiest part. But also you approached at the limiting angle of attack. So it was wow. 20 units. Um, and we had an audio system, but you approached at the angle of attack limit. And okay. you couldn't ever throttle back too much because then you lost the blow pressure over the wings um, and it would fall out of the sky. So yeah, overall it was not easy, but it was a no flare landing. You just flew it into the ground. Okay. You kicked off drift and a crosswind. But no, it was um, an interesting handful to actually approach at the limiting angle of attack. Okay, well, I mean, it's the first time I hear a story like this, so it is fascinating to get that insight. It just looks like one of those beautiful airplanes, like the, the Mirage 3 or Raphael. Some, some aircraft just look good, and they just look like they want to fly nicely, too. Oh, absolutely, and, and you get it 350 to 550 knots at low level and fly around quite happily at 20 feet over the sea. <laughs> okay, so Buccaneers, you go out on your operational tours there in the sort of Middle East, and, uh, at, and at some point then you get yourself onto experimental test pilots course and you did your training at Boscombe Down as well? I did indeed. I did the ECPS course in 1985 um, and it, again it was always been an ambition of mine to go there and from when I was at University Air Squadron uh, that was what I wanted to go and do was to be a test pilot on what's called A Squadron, the Fighter Test Squadron at Boscombe Down and that was my focus from there before I even got to my first operational tour um, and it's one of those things I was lucky, right place at the right time, but somebody's got to do it. Hmm. And um, yes, yeah, so I did test part school at Boscombe Down in 1985 after my first five-year tour. Okay. And, uh, and so once you become a test pilot, it's one of those qualifications that then changes your whole career and you, you forever are a test pilot. And so you'll ever, forever be not only want to be used, but continue to be used as a test pilot. And, and, and in the 80s, I mean, nearly four decades now of experimental test flying. So tell us about some of those early projects that you got involved in uh, at ETPS. Yeah, I mean, from when I finished the course, I went to A Squadron. The major projects I was involved with were the Jaguar and the Tornado, um, both the ground attack and the air defense tornadoes, plus continuing work on Buccaneer. Um, the Tucano was a new trainer. I was the development project pilot for a variable stability Hawk for ETPS. Um, and we used to go and do the odd assessments, evaluations on other different airplanes. And one that I did was, um, in the very early days, an assessment of the F-117 um, stealth fighter when it was still a completely secret program. Uh, so I was just phenomenally uh, lucky with the opportunities that I had. And I suppose there's a picture of the Jaguar there now that you shared with me. Um, having so many different opportunities and I mean, quite a wide variety of fleets in the RAF at the time as well, sort of late 80s and early 90s. What um, is there anything that stands out in the sort of Jaguar? I know there's something you're quite involved in with the Jaguar program. What kind of things were you doing there? I mean, some of the one of the really interesting phases was the lead up to Gulf War One with the Jaguar and the Tornado. So, on the Jaguar, we integrated CRV-7 rockets, uh, AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles on overwing pylons. But it was all done in incredibly short time, where there were a lot of people around with a lot of experience, and we were trusted. We, we made decisions, we took risks, and we got things done very quickly. That's an interesting picture there because that goes on to 1994 when um, the conflict was going on in Bosnia, Operation Deny um, Flight. And they wanted on the Jaguar to put a targeting pod on as well as carrying a laser-guided bomb. And they hadn't got many pylons, so we put the targeting bomb under one wing and the uh, the targeting pod under one wing, the bomb underneath the other. So we had a lateral asymmetry, okay. um, which was towards the wing with a bomb on um, up until the point when you dropped it and instantly swapped it away. <laughs> the Jaguar did not like lateral stores like this. So we did a big 
um, handling program. And then we decided we would go for an endpoint of actually dropping a bomb. So I always find the photo chase in a two seat Jaguar taking this picture. And it, and I got a, somebody who was relatively inexperienced on the Jag, but an experienced test pilot to fly the sortie, just to, to see what he thought of the handling qualities of going from the symmetry one way to the other and then doing a 4G um, dive recovery. Because I got so used to the handling qualities of the airplane mm. in that configuration. I started to think, uh, am I just automatically compensating? Will mm. the average squadron pilot be able to do this? So that was an end point when we went and dropped the bomb. Okay, so that's an interesting point you raised there, which uh, I suppose it, it, it was one of the things I wanted to talk with you about is, as an experimental test pilot, I mean, it's not only about new airplanes, but it's reconfiguring current airplanes and changing perhaps roles or, or you know, external aerodynamics and controllability issues. How do you know when it's, as you say, you're just used to controlling this bent airplane or plane that flies funny, you just know how to do it. And where do you, how do you know when to draw the line to say, that's not squadron pilot material. Uh, this is just either above or just too different or not to try and put the person down, but where do you, how do you draw that line? It's a very interesting one, a very fine point at times of what you say absolutely no to, what you make recommendations for training when you put limitations on it. Um, there are specification documents so that you can get guidance from there of whether it meets the specification or not. And you then need to get a cross section of pilots to go off and try it because some people are what we call high gain, they're real mm -hmm. stick twishes and thrash around and also will respond to very, very small errors. Others are very low gain, smooth language, and you need to have a cross section of both. Okay. Now, I did as a test pilot, you need to be able to vary your gains from high gain to low gain. So you can go high gain to find the problems, but you can then, when they develop, go low gain to recover the airplane <laughs> and go back and land. But it is always a judgment call um, and multiple pilots, guidance from the specifications um, to then decide. But sometimes um, it's a case of it's an absolute no-no. But more often, you'll limit the flight envelope or just give recommendations for training that's needed before you go off and fly those configurations. Okay. Now, did I understand correctly when you talked about, uh, is that, so I understand pilots are high gain or low gain, but as an experimental test pilot, do you have to vary your flying style within a sortie? Go out and do high gain and you change to the low gain or is it two different people, two different flights? No, you, the big thing is that for an individual, what you want is any pilot, if you like, any test pilot, mm -hmm. to be able to go high gain Yep. to get in to identify sure. the problem areas because if you just find low gain the whole time you may not see them yeah. but having gone high gain and found the problems you then need to be able to switch to low gain to actually recover the ah, airplane okay. and go back and go back and land safely is that a skill that's taught in the the tp program um it's something we expose people, especially with the variable stability airplanes, um, to what it's like to fly something that's got poor flying qualities. And it's like even nowadays, when people say, why do you still need to fly old airplanes when you're teaching people to be <laughs> test pilots? Well, that's because old airplanes had some real deficiencies. Whereas if ah. you just go and fly ones that are modern airplanes in service, they've probably been designed out and ironed out. So a lot of test pilot training is an education because okay. people have flown maybe three trainer types and mm. one frontline type you sure. need to expose them to as wide a range of airplanes and characteristics as possible okay all right well let's keep it quite topical um thanks for your questions guys keep bringing it in friends asking what are your thoughts we're going from old airplanes with deficiencies to the most modern what are your thoughts on the dragon launch as an experimental test flight and them not being primarily in control that is a very interesting one. It depends on what your motivation to work is. Because I actually watch that with great interest sure. on TV. Yeah, both um, days. And frankly, <laughs> yeah, it's not the sort of thing that would be that high on my list of things to go and do. Because uh -huh. what you're doing is you're managing automation and um, you are managing the process to achieve the tasks that are required. Whereas, frankly, my big passion in flying is all about a man controlling a machine. Okay. You've got four degrees of freedom, you can try the flight path, which is why my heart lies in World War II airplanes and, and early generation jets. So it's a fascinating program for somebody who is really keen and interested in automation and in modern technology. It's a fantastic program, the Dragon Capture one. But if somebody's heart is embedded in old airplanes, then it's yeah. probably best to go and find something else to do. <laughs> sure. Okay, great. Guys, keep your questions coming. Um, what I would like to know now is, so, so you, 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 
I have to create this new skill. And um, all right, so let's fast forward a little bit. So you've been a TP for a while, you've done lots of projects. At what point do you come back? Is it a, an, a recognized career path, much like becoming a, a commercial pilot or a military pilot and then a flying instructor? If you're an experimental test pilot with enough experience, is there a course to then become an experimental test pilot tutor? Is that a recognized step or is that just something that kind of blends into some folk and doesn't for others? I mean, from when I did it, it was a case of going to the school, getting the basics of um, learning to... Because I'd done the weapons instructor course, so I had an instructional background from that. Um, And it was then a case of applying those instructional skills to converting people to the airplane types we had. And then each of the individual exercises, sorties we flew, then just having somebody else take you through them at the points you were trying to actually teach. So it was quite an informal process in those days. If we roll on to where we are now under EASA licensing, Mm -hmm. there is a specific flight test instructor's rating that goes on your license. I like there's a flight test rating for different levels of flight testing there's also a flight test instructors rating okay all right so you get involved in, in flight test tutoring uh, and what is that part like is this is it is it as much fun uh, showing people the way of learning new things as it is doing the new things for you i mean i think from an instructional point of view then it's a year-long course so there's there's lots of variety during the year it can become a groundhog day but at times um, especially <laughs> after three decades um <laughs> But no, I think I've always been extremely fortunate in having the opportunity to carry on still doing flight test programs. Mm. Uh, And I think it's important for staying current with the processes and the way in which flight test is done, as well as maintaining professional standards. So I've had that as well as recreational flying um, with displays with the warbirds, plus flying for um, some other companies on different sorts of contracts, some of it flight test related um, and some of it mission support. So I think the important thing, certainly for me, is to maintain the professional aspects in addition to the instructing. And then you've got so much more to offer sure. with the instructing. So as a, as a tutor instructing the, the uh, TPs, do you still uh, get involved in other projects as well? Um, not so much recently. I was involved certainly with the tornado projects until they stopped flight test about three years ago. Um, and there's the other small integration bits, certainly that I do for some, um, for some companies. So I do take the opportunity to get involved when I can. Okay, great. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about some of these things. So I'm going to put up some of these uh, warbirds because that's been passionate for you as well. So talk us through some of the warbirds that you've, uh, that you've shared with me and the ones that you've enjoyed flying. Sure, that's the um, Grumman Hellcat, which has probably got the nicest flying qualities of any World War II aeroplane <laughs> that I have flown. And it's a big aeroplane, but it, with yeah. a big wing. So, you know, it's the same sort of threshold speeds as um, a Spitfire, same loop entry speeds, but an absolutely delightful aeroplane. There aren't many of them in the world now, but it's a really, really nice aeroplane. Mm, and now what, uh, what makes it special in terms of handling qualities? What are those things that you enjoy or makes it silky smooth? Or what's the feeling? Um... It's got really well harmonized controls, so a bit heavier in pitch than a roll, but control force is such that you can easily fly it with one hand. Uh, Pratt & Whitney R2800 engine so that all those big radials, if you push the throttle fully forward, you will over boost it. Um, And because of loads on the engine, then there's a minimum power setting according to your RPM. Well, I've lost your sound again there. Uh, lost your sound there, Dave. All right, so while uh, Dave's just getting the, the sound fixed up again there, please bring your questions coming. We're going to come to uh, South Africans that have joined the RAF. Uh, let's see what's happening. There we go. Are you there, Dave? I'm sorry, having these technical difficulties. Please keep your questions coming. Uh, we do have uh, some uh, a, a good mutual friend that has not flying the RAF but been through the Empire Test Pilot School. And we're going to bring up uh, Patrick shortly. I see I've just lost Dave on the connection. So while he is busy joining back in, uh, I'll just put up some of the, the pictures that he shared with me. And then we can come back to the discussion on these pictures in a moment while I connect up with Dave once again. Oh, I've lost you. Hi, oh, Dave, you there? I'm there. There we go. Okay, sound is better. All right, I've just... Um, Yep, I've just put up the, the picture. Just going to get my headset back. Okay. Oh, 
Is All that, right, I see. On? That's it. Good. I can hear you straight well, live. I'm going to just uh, share what, what what we're showing on the screen once again. One of the uh, uh, Hellcat. Is it the Hellcat? Oh, the Midwing? The Wildcat. Wildcat. So that was in pre <laughs> um, And I've just lost you on sound, I'm afraid. Okay. Can you hear me testing one, two? One, two yeah, one, it's two. the link to my headset that's gone. I might have to go off okay. the headset. Okay. Go, go off the headset now. Let's just sort that out once and for all then, maybe. Right. How, can you hear me now? Still good, yeah. How am I coming through on your okay, side? Okay, that's fine. I can All right. hear you. Perfect. Yeah, so that's the Grumman Wildcat, which was the predecessor of the Hellcat. Slightly smaller engine. Again, a really nice airplane to fly in pitch. Um, and directionally, not much trim change with speed or power. But it's got pretty weak ailerons. It doesn't roll uh -huh. um, as well. But one of the big things is that the landing gear, you wind up and down mechanically by hand. So <laughs> off you take off with this great winding. And you've got to keep the speed back, otherwise it gets too difficult. Um, so, yeah, that's quite a, a challenge. If you end up doing a go-around, then personally, <laughs> I leave the wheels down. I don't, once they're down, they stay down. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, so that's really like getting stuck in and just, uh, you know, be, like like a glove you know like those old airplanes they sound good they smell good they feel good and you and you actually have a workout at the same time too absolutely and i think you know, they're, they're all similar to fly the systems the biggest things to get on top of the fuel system and the emergency landing gear on most of them and those are the things that there are big differences and can catch you out if you really get it wrong yeah okay let's go back to some of your uh, um sort of uh, RAF times, and there's a buccaneer that's tanking with a TriStar. So tell us what's going on with this picture. Is this just for a lock, or is this a test? Well, it was interesting. That was the time when we were doing the development trials of the TriStar. Um, and we had a buccaneer buddy-buddy tanker on the squadron to support all the other trials. And it had been often talked about in the bar on a Friday night about <laughs> trying to plug the TriStar into the buccaneer. And our then group captain was there at the time. I should, certainly shan't name names. Um, <laughs> he said, okay, guys, you can go and do this on one condition. I want to be in the right seat of the TriStar. Um, and it was obviously a very experienced um, TriStar uh, tanker pilot. And they mm -hmm. went off and, and did this. And it was, it was all thought through carefully and safely. Mm -hmm. um, but what we did do, because this is the days of real photographs and not digital. Sure. We just say, if anybody queried what we did, we say it wasn't a real photograph. We just actually forged it, which um, <laughs> wasn't quite true. But the interesting thing, from the flying point of view, was that the um, bow wave from the TriStar pushed the Buccaneer up about a thousand feet while it was making contact. Oh, and wow. the Buccaneer pilot was just throttling back more and more and more to maintain the speed. But yeah, that was genuinely done. But in a different era, a different culture, I can guarantee that would not happen nowadays. <laughs> sure. Okay. Is it usual that the TriStar would do tanking with something? It's just unusual to do it off a Buccaneer? Or does the yeah, TriStar not just do... Tri yeah. TriStar, TriStar. They made okay. an... TriStar Victor as well, but it was just sort of mutual um, support. It would only be off another big, uh, big tanker. And then the Buccaneer is that is that quite common that a Buccaneer would tank something else too? Yes, it was, but not on the overland squadrons, but on the maritime squadrons, we always kept one rolled up um, as a tanker, both for tanking currency, but to support tar. So quite often, if you went off, say with the um, with the Jaguar to the range, and you're going to be short on fuel, the Buccaneer tanker would go as well, and we would use that to support other um, test activity. Okay, all right. Uh, another jet that's now close to your heart here is the Hunter. You sent me that picture. Ah, the Hunter. I'm digging it out just now. So you flew your last single-seat RAF fighter yesterday for the last time in your career because you're approaching, uh, yeah, I'm approaching your birthday. Yeah, I'm approaching I was only 23 when I started flying it, so oh. I've been incredibly fortunate to have Flown it. I mean, it's still my favourite airplane, the Hunter. But I've had the opportunity to fly it for basically 42 years, with a gap in the middle um, when I went to the airline and when I then first came back um, from the airline afterwards. But now it's still my favourite machine. And those are uh, ex Swiss Air Force Mark 58s from Hawker Under Aviation. Okay, and is this um, is this Hawker Under Aviation linked to the ETPS, or is this an independent thing flying warbirds? Um, no, Hawkins Aviation is a commercial company that provides um, mission support uh, with the hunters for different contractors. So they're UK military registered, um, have a two-seater, which is uh, an aeroplane, which we can put um, development systems in for contractors with one of their observers. Um, and obviously, we can put stores on the single-seaters as well. They do support ETPS as providing target aeroplanes for a variable stability machine. And we've had two-seaters from HHN. 
in the past, you've been, <clears throat> where um, we have used it as an exercise for the students. So it's a completely separate company, but they do contract in to um, for tasks to ETPS. Okay, all right, nice. It's a lovely airplane. Makes it, that's the one that makes the nice blue note. It does, but a lot of that noise comes from um, the airflow over the gun barrels on the nose. So it depends on which mark and what gun barrels you've got. So okay. it was the RAF Mark 6s and 9s that gave the best blue note, but yeah, classic <laughs> noise. <laughs> that's lovely. Yeah. Okay, we've got another question coming in for you, Dave. Uh, my father in law's joined us. He says, Hello, he said, Back to flying the Buccaneers. He was a, a Navy man and he said that he played many war games against these great aircraft. Did you perchance fly off the Cape of Good Hope during the 1970s with a Buccaneer? No, I didn't. And that would have been the Navy days with 809 squadron off the Ark Royal, which sadly I missed out on the last cruise of the Ark Royal by about a year. Um, the last cruise was about two thirds of the cruise were RAF, but it was just going out of service as I started flying it. Okay. So sadly not. <laughs> sadly not. <laughs> Sorry, Jock, but keep your questions coming. Great questions coming through today. You're welcome to stay interactive with the show. I want to then uh, just zoom in a little bit now on the specifics of uh, training, the experimental test pilot. So, so the course itself, a good friend of mine, Patrick Wilcock, uh, recently came through there with you and that's how we connected yep. and thank you for that. And he, along the way, I visited very close to Boscombe Down last year when he was uh, busy there. Um, talking through the, the Learjet, I think it's the Learjet that has all these different types of yep. controls. So yep. if you can just take a moment and maybe just dumb it down to just a commercial pilot or a PPL level, what these control systems are, what they're doing and, and what are they attempting to teach you and What's the logic behind these airplanes? Certainly, so with something like the Learjet, in the left seats, the uh, safety pilot, the instructor, has the normal flight controls connected to the airplane. But in the right seat, the um, yoke has actually been replaced by a stick, which is connected to just give electrical signals to a computer, the same as the rudder pedals, and there's also a side stick in there. So there is no direct link from the controls in the cockpit to the normal aircraft control surfaces. But it's just like a fly-by-wire airplane. So you can think of it that the right seat is a fly-by-wire airplane. But you can change all the clever bits and the algorithms and the feedback loops and the gains. So you can actually put numbers in to change the characteristics of your fly-by-wire system. Okay. So that you can make an airplane that's unstable in pitch, um, that simulates having very high roll inertia, pitch inertia, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. You can have different sensitivities. So you need bigger stick inputs, smaller stick inputs. You can vary the force for a stick input. So it's really a sophisticated fly-by-wire airplane where you can change the computer system inside in flight. And, and, and is this something that's sort of pre-programmed, there's 10 things and you say A, B, C, D, E, or is it something that you go and say, I want to add a bit more pitch now, see what that feels like, I want to add a bit more? You can do either. So you can either change parameters individually as you go, uh, and obviously you've worked out for the teaching points in advance what numbers to set. But if you had a case where there are multiple values to change that would take a long time, sure. you can have a program so those are all combined together in one file, if you like. So you can just instantly load that file and it will change eight things at the same time to save time. Okay. And what is the sort of, if you, I know there's lots of things that you'll, you'll discover and uncover, but what is the thing that you're trying to get across to the student when you are showing them a different characteristic? Maybe just name one. Uh, I remember, I can't even remember what the term is, but Patrick was trying to explain to me, once you understand this new way of understanding aerodynamics, you'll never look at it another way again. What are you trying to get across by changing things? Uh Okay, it's really to expose people to what an aeroplane feels like under these circumstances. So I sit in the classroom, they'll go through all sorts of lectures and equations and one thing or another, but the light bulb moment is when you go off and try. So if we actually say an aeroplane with its longitudinal stability. Mm -hmm. So if you've got an aeroplane, most aeroplanes are stable. So when you accelerate, you have to put a push force in, move the stick forward, and then trim those down. Yeah. Now, if it's neutral, you accelerate, and there's no stick movement, there's no change in force. Okay. But if it's unstable as you accelerate, the stick has to come back, and you have to trim those up, which most people have never seen. And so you can actually expose somebody to okay. what it is like to fly an airplane like that. So that if they go off on a development program, fly an airplane, and experience those characteristics, they understand what they're seeing. Okay, all right. So you, you're teaching them... 
uh, a trick that's going to, well, not a trick, but uh, understanding the logic of sort of aerodynamic and balance and controls that used later, you recognize. Is, is the purpose then for them to uh, use that knowledge to, to describe what that new airplane is or to use that knowledge to, to fix that new airplane? Yeah, so the flying is only um, you know, a fairly small part, actually, of training people to be test pilots. One of the, <laughs> I've other, heard. <laughs> the two other big aspects, one is planning the test. So you have objectives, you have a scope, you have an aim of a test program. Okay. So once you've been given that, you have to put it down to fine detail for planning exactly the tests that you need to go off and fly in the airplane. You then fly them, you gather the data, and then you've got a report on it. And it's quite interesting that somebody who is the best part in the world goes off and gets all good data. If he can't report it well, mm. he's going to lose to the person who's actually not very good at all, but can, can write a convincing case at the end of it. So the, the reporting is a really, really major part of the, of the training. This sounds a bit like a fighter squadron from the RAF. You lost the fight, but you won the debrief. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, modern recording media tend to um, put that one to, to the back. But yeah, I, I was being. Yeah, sorry, sure, no, no, yeah, I get not it. Not sarcastic, but it, it is just one of the things that um, the writing is a real skill which you develop over years. And frankly, for my own side, then I was a mathematician and a scientist at school and, uh, and through training. So my writing was never that good. But then, having spent so long teaching other people how to write precisely, I'd become an absolute pedant at grammar uh, and just really, really precise wording to make sure there's no ambiguity whatsoever. Uh, and so if I see something written down as ambiguities in it, it drives me more nowadays. <laughs> I have to have things that are very precise and clear. Okay. All right. So that, that, that first exposure, you've talk, talk, talk in the classroom. You get airborne and you see what unstable feels like, uh, you know, pull back and trim forward, etc. What... What is the sort of uh, sink or swim feeling? I mean, are they chucked in the deep end and it just keeps sink, sink, sink? Or is it, is it a building block approach? What do you yeah, get to where at the end of the six months of flying and, and analyzing, they can say, I'm an experimental test pilot. What, what is that gate that, they, that you see in them? I think there's two aspects. One is the content. So I think if um, oh, Patrick did his course, if you like, in, in two parts, so there's a, a short six-month course, if you like, and then there's the full 12-month one. So Patrick had done his training and gained a lot of experience to cover the first half of it uh, and then came to us for the, the um, top-up to complete it to the full, um, the full course. And some of it, there are essential aspects that need to be covered, but you also need consolidation. It's not the sort of subject, there's so much scope to it. You can't just tell people once and they will then get it. So all the skills yeah. are perishable, um, but you need consolidation for people to really build and understand it. Um, and a lot of it, when we get into avionic systems and, mm -hmm. and mission systems, then that's a philosophy of the testing that people just need to have multiple exposures to it to learn the philosophy. So a lot of it is consolidation. When it then comes to it, it's a progressive assessment all the way through where we're looking for a learning curve. And we'll typically do an end of course exercise where they go off and fly an aeroplane that they've never flown before for a few sorties. Um, we give them a mission, we give them a scope, they write a report. And we know the standard that's required on that report. Okay. In addition, then there is an end of course check ride that we fly as well to see how they, how well they fly the aeroplane, how well they fly the tests, um, how they manage it. Safety is obviously the overriding consideration. So sure. there's big CRM uh, considerations if you are multiple crew or even just sitting in the aeroplane with people on the telemetry link on the ground. Okay. Uh, and then we, we tend to do that as a, a verbal debrief post-flight rather than a written report. We cover the written reporting elsewhere. But it is a big, long, consolidated process to, uh, to get people to the required standard. Okay. And uh, that's interesting that you bring up CRM. It's a passion of mine as well. I've been involved in that for a long time. Uh, CRM being, an, is, it a, is it a standalone thing or is it just something that you drive through all the way through the course with your students? Uh, it's all the way through the course because you have the CRM of normal airplane operation. But if you've mm. got two people in the airplane, one flying, one gathering the data, <clears throat> then who does what? It varies from test point to test point. And so you have to plan and brief very carefully so that the flight test CRM is not standard. 
you don't have a manual which you just all follow the same. Um, one of the differences to the commercial world is that you typically know the people you're flying with very well mm. and you've flown and operated with them a lot. So it's not like um, pitching up a check-in and going off with somebody you've never met before sure. and sticking the SOPs that way. So the CRM is different. You have to plan mm. it, you have to think about it, you have to brief it, and it does vary from each test that you fly. Okay, all right. Uh, Dave, there's some more questions coming through, and it, uh, I'm going to try and blend two questions. One, uh, Jeremy and Jasmine both asking now, what is the difference between the ETPS and NTPS? Is there any sort of different philosophy? And then uh, to build on that, uh, do you have any experience with Skunkworks and that kind of an approach to uh, experimental uh, development? So, first of all, the, <clears throat> the test particles, there's four um, military test particles in the Western world. There's the, uh, the UK one ETPS, Epner in France, the US Navy test particle School at Patuxent River, and the US Air Force test particle School at Edwards. But there's also some civilian test pilot schools like National Test Pilot School in Mojave. Um, and there's lots of different levels of flight tests, different qualifications. And so some of the schools like NTPS will run quite a few short courses, which may not be related to a, um, a award of a specific rating, but is training somebody to do a specific job. So they're all different. Um, certainly the four military schools have very, very close liaison um, yeah. and exchanges both of, uh, of students instructors we have well, with the US Navy um, and we go and fly with the other schools as well. So it's just there are differences and it depends on where their target market is. But NTPS is different being a pure okay. civilian school angled largely towards FAA. Uh, All right. Okay. So the scope works. Um, my new involvement was with the assessment I did in the F117 back in 1986 um, with it being a black program and we never went anywhere near the scope works and actually anywhere near the company people at the time we just dealt with the, um, the training squadron and the test squadron okay. from uh, the base where we were flying and what was that like f117 uh, i mean that was just one of those completely surreal things i was a 30 year old <laughs> flight lieutenant working directly for the uk chief of the air staff going and flying this airplane that didn't exist from a base that didn't exist <laughs> <laughs> meetings with the Secretary of State for Defence and the Chief of their Air Staff. And it, it was one of those things where I thought at the time, then this is probably going to be the highlight of my working career, which frankly it has been. Oh, um, I've had lots of fantastic opportunities since then, but it was just so, such a completely unbelievable opportunity to have. <laughs> and just the level of technology in the aeroplane back then, oh. the most sophisticated thing I've flown was the original version of the Jaguar. Um, and to go off and, and fly that was absolutely fascinating. So uh, did you write that in your, your entries in your logbook that didn't exist too? Oh, uh, well, that <laughs> it had the dates and it had the hours, but nothing else. But there was a secret <laughs> scrap of paper floating around in my house. And when eventually it came out that we could talk about what we, uh, we had done, then I entered the serial numbers and the uh, brief details in my logbook. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Were there many um, non-Americans flying the F-117? Um, there were two of us went out from the squadron, <laughs> myself and the squadron commander. Um, and then there was an RAF exchange tour set up after that. I think mm -hmm. there were about another maybe eight um, Brits flew. I don't know of anybody from any other nations other than the UK and the US that, uh, that flew it. Okay, so but you went out in an experimental test role, not just to fly the aeroplane. Um, what it was, I've just got something on my screen. I was going to see what happens if I dab it. Okay. Um, <laughs> what it was, there was actually, it was on the table for the UK to purchase something if they wanted uh. to. And it was also just the early days of um, EFA, European Fighter Aircraft. And the Americans wanted us to have an awareness of what the state of the art was with respect to low observable technology. Um, and it was the height of the Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher special relationship. Uh, and it came out of that. So it was the Americans wanting to open their soul, show us what they had. And, and potentially there was um, an offer on the table for us to purchase some more. That wasn't a practical solution. Okay. Well, it's, it sounds like a fascinating um, project and time in your life. How long were you involved with that project? Um, we were out there for four weeks. So okay. we went out. In brief to the Pentagon, did the ground school, did the simulators, flew the airplane, at brief to the Pentagon, and came home. So it's four weeks away. Okay, wonderful. Well, that, that sounds fascinating to just be involved in, in all the detail around uh, 
test flying, etc. And, and I suppose that's really the point of becoming an experimental test pilot is to get involved in either uh, significant projects or brand new airplanes. Have you been involved in anything brand new first flight? Um, the only first flight I've done was one of the models of the Jaguar, the GR1B. So it was, it was some avionics upgrades to the Jaguar. But no, I've done quite a few last flights. I think my efforts <laughs> are for me. I've done more last flights than first. But the, the GR1B Jaguar, the variable stability Hawk, after we converted it, I did the first flight. Um, but no, from a military test point, pilot point of view, you don't often get involved mm. with first flights. That's more the companies who've manufactured the uh, the airplanes. Sure. Okay. Well, from talking about interesting airplanes, I'm flashing up these uh, these old things okay, too. Okay. I'm just going to try something on my phone again to get the picture back. <laughs> Are we still there? It was still there. ME109. Yeah, that's... Um, I'll leave it for there. Yeah, that's an airplane uh, that was... It's an original ME109 G2. It was captured in Libya in 1943. It was the first 109G that was captured by the Australians. Um, okay. And the Australian part so used it as his own personal airplane for a short while before <laughs> it was discovered. <laughs> it. it was then brought back to the UK and it became part of the enemy aircraft flight at RAF Collie Western, which is now where Wittering is. Um, and they so they evaluated it throughout the war there. Winkle Brown was somebody who um, flew that airframe. And after the war, it then went around, and I think Paul Raymond had it in some aeroplane static exhibition somewhere. And eventually, um, there was a chap called Ross Snadden who um, asked permission. I think it ended up in MOD, UK MOD hands. And, and they were looking for somebody to rebuild it. So Russ, who was um, an RAF pilot at the time, but a great interest in engineering and rebuilding, got permission to rebuild it. And the plan was to put it on static in the RAF museum. And Russ then said, well, can we carry on and get it airworthy and to better flying condition? And they said, yes, OK, for a limited flying life. And they spent 19 years rebuilding it. Yeah. <clears throat> and just before it flew, they determined the limited flying life to be um, three years. And there were a couple of us who were flying Merlin engines, one uh, of the Bouchons, um, one of whom was a group captain test pilot, but then Reg Hallam. Reg did the first flight on it and then went to um, Saudi Arabia. And then it came to somebody else who was a three-star or four-star, but then John Allison, um, who became the chief pilot on it. And because after the boot on it, he phoned me up one day and said, would you like to fly back to it? <laughs> and say, oh, God, then twist my arm off. Um, <laughs> because it was it was owned by MOD, but operated by the Imperial War Museum and Dutch under contract. So it started with John and myself, and then um, Charlie Brown and Cliff Spink came as well. I mean, in the end, we flew it for six years, from 1991 to 1997. And from the rebuild, I mean, it was totally original. The only changes was we'd gone from 12 volt to 24 volt DC electrics, the gun sight had been removed. We had a modern Becker radio, and that was it. It was totally original. So the cockpit was labelled in German, and it was run as a UK CAA permanent flight aeroplane. And um, we managed to convince the UK CAA that we'd all done German at school to a certain <laughs> standard. So they let us keep it labelled in German. Um, and that was it. Uh, but such a privilege to be able to fly that. A very, very special yeah. aeroplane. And in particular because of the team that rebuilt it, the, uh, the whole bonding and the spirit sure. behind it, just unbelievable. It almost takes on a sort of a life of itself too. It is, you're all kind of connected to the aeroplane, but the aeroplane is almost a living, breathing thing and you get to display it and, and take it places. Oh, it sounds like a yeah, wonderful story. Absolutely. And, and it was, yeah, we were limited what we did with it. We didn't do complete loops, um, pulling down to the vertical, but we did sometimes fly it um, as a pair in a tail chase <clears throat> with other aeroplanes. And it came from North Africa. I did, I remember doing one against the P-40 and we often flew it against Spitfires and sometimes you were behind, sometimes you were in front. And the hairs in the back of your neck would go up. <laughs> that you were either one day flying a Spitfire chasing a Messerschmitt or flying a Messerschmitt chasing a Spitfire being, being sure. chased. It really was a very, it was quite emotional really. Yeah. It was a very, very special time. Sure, it's surreal. People are commenting about the sort of Nazi logo as well. But I mean, it's all original. It, you, it was captured and it's the original aircraft. But uh, but talking about Spitfires and, and Warbirds too. So there's a nice um, celebration formo that you're a part of too. So tell us what's going on here. That was in 2003. And it was a celebration of the 100th anniversary of the first flight by the Wright brothers. So we did that at Duxford for a weekend show. We did it on the Saturday and the Sunday. And that was from the 
Sunday. We had 13 airplanes all mixed. I'm in the Grumman Hellcat right at the back. And everybody else is prop wash bouncing around. Um, <laughs> But yeah, anyway, it was fantastic to be able to do that. And it was quite interesting. We were supposed to have, I think, 17 aeroplanes in the practice, and it came down to 13 aeroplanes and no practice. Uh, and that Sunday picture is quite interesting. It's all very symmetrical both days, but it's just that bit tighter on the Sunday. Oh, okay, well, it looks like fun. And so you've been involved oh, in, yeah. in, in warbirds and, and, and fly paths and displays and air shows for a while too. I mean, you've just got such a diverse range of, uh, of aircraft and stories about it. Is there anything that stands out from displaying these, uh, these warbirds? So either way, that feels good or you get the appreciation or that special air show. Anything that stands out for you? Um, I mean, I think it's always a huge privilege to go and do it. And there is always a balance between personal satisfaction showing off the airplane. And it's all about demonstrating and showing off the airplane. Mm. But there is a huge amount of satisfaction from it. If I could pick one thing, I think of all the individual airframes that I've flown, there's certainly the experiences with Black Six um, and the team there would, would come out top. But the fighter collection, who I fly for mainly at Duxford now, again, fantastic ethos, mm. group of airplanes, opportunities. Um, and I, I think you know, some of it, with the, there's a Spitfire we've got there. We're in a display. I met, I met two pilots who actually flew that airplane during the war oh, on different wow. squadrons. Um, wow. And we... Again, with, with Black Six, Gunter Rohl, who I think was the third highest score in German ace, came over when they are making a TV series, and we sat him in the airplane and got him to stop the engine, but we left the chocks in, otherwise he'd have been off, that's for sure. <laughs> and it, it is just those sorts of opportunities that are, that are really very special. For sure. Oh, you've seen so many pictures here. I don't know if I'm going to do it justice. I was, we, oh, sorry, I flashed that one up already. Uh, where was the one there? This is the one I was looking for here. So uh, tell us about your story here. With the, why is there a bright orange uh, meteor on the tail? Right. So those airplanes are um, ejection seat test airplanes for Martin Baker, the company that make ejection seats. So they start off life as a two-seater, they've been heavily modified. So the rear seat, there's a big um, strengthened tub in there, if you like, and the experimental seats are put in there so you fly along and you fire the seat out to make sure it all functions correctly. So they keep these two aeroplanes, and yes, they're old aeroplanes now, but they're so heavily modified, then to modify another platform to do this job would be a seriously big investment. And mm. I mean, it's a fascinating company, Martin Baker, because it's still a family company. Um, and James Martin of the original Martin Baker, mm. his sons and grandson are directors of the company now, oh, and wow. they're still... Uh, still totally running it and they've always used meteors as their ejection seat test airplanes so there is a historical element to this as well <laughs> but these are still fully functional working airplanes is it the, the back looks like there's a canopy is removed is that right yes it is okay um, save the canopy is, each time because uh, because if you go on a flight is it generally to to eject this the seat yeah or it's just um i mean there's there's certain amount of flying we do on the airplanes for currency and taking them places. Um, interestingly, there's the, the next trial we've got planned is in uh, Deci Mamanu in Sardinia. And they are building fairings to go over the rear cockpits to reduce the drag to improve the range on the airplane. Because it is quite draggy having that mm. big hole there. But, um, 450 knots is the maximum speed for firing the seats. And we can fly the airplanes up to 475. Um, and so there's a reasonable bit of drag from having that, that hole in the back. Mm, okay, well, it looks like a fun, there's another picture of, uh, of flying this airplane. It looks like a fun airplane to fly. Is that a fun one to fly? It is. It's a, I really enjoy flying it. And again, it's a 70-year-old airplane. Um, but that's why the lights keep going off on the auto sensor. Um, yes, it, it is. It, it, there's, there's all sorts of horror stories about it asymmetric. But this is the real last build standard of the Meteor. So it's got the big fin and rudder off the F-8 and the later night fighters. So even though it starts off life as a 2-seat train and T-7 with a small fin and rudder, then these have been modified. So yeah, heavy foot force is asymmetric, but um, it is controllable. <laughs> and uh, as an experimental test pilot doing flights for Martin Baker, are you involved in the actual seat side of things too, or just flying the platform for them? Um, I fly the platform to help them out. So I haven't done any seat firing yet, but hopefully I'll get to do one in the not too distant future. <laughs> and have you had any Martin Baker landings yourself? Um, you know, where's there a piece of wood? No, I, I've been within a couple of seconds of jumping out a couple of times, but oh. no, I haven't got the tie yet. And what, what, is the, what was the difference those couple of seconds made? What, what happened? Um, one was an inadvertent spin in a tornado on a trial where 
the, the nominal ejection height was 10,000 feet. Um, and I decided I was over the sea, I'll go at nine, I give it the benefit of the doubt, and the aeroplane did <laughs> just start to recover at 10,000 feet. Um, and there was another one actually in, um, in a hunter on a touch and go. I had a, an engine failure at Shedder blade off the first stage of the turbine and completely trashed the engine. Mm. Um, but luckily my wheels were on the ground with 8,000 foot of runway ahead of me, so things don't get much better <laughs> when you have, have a stock engine failure. So I just stopped. Yeah. But had it have happened five seconds later, 10 seconds later, we'd have been airborne, then we'd have ejected. Mm. Okay. So, uh, and likewise, if it had happened 10 seconds before we touched down, we'd have ejected again. Um, so yeah, I think those are probably the two closest I've had to put it out. Okay, well, I'm really putting you on the spot there. So you've got two weeks left until your 65th birthday, so I wish you all the best for that. Does that mean Thanks, this, <laughs> that there's some uh, flying that you will no longer be able to do? Are you still gonna be a tutor? Oh yes, um, the flying that I do now is um, civil registered as an, under an approved training organisation. So okay. finally, keep on medical, there's no age uh, oh. restrictions on that. So oh. it's purely UK military regulated aeroplanes um, for flying solo or single pilot today, 65. So I can still okay. continue to fly two pilot aeroplanes, um, military registered or single pilot for um, for the civilian instructing and the, the warbirds and things that are on the permit to fly, okay. then there is no age restriction. It's um, fine, you keep your medical and you keep on, the insurers will <laughs> cover you, then the game's on. Okay, and right, last couple of questions for you, Dave. It's been great chatting to you, but I want to get to some specifics about high performance teams. You've been involved in a high performance team in some shape or another for decades now, from the operational yeah. squadron uh, to operational test flying to uh, uh, qualified weapons instructor, uh, F117, night talk, etc teaching people to become experimental test pilots, uh, you know, warbirds and, and recovery as a restoration of warbirds. In the spirit of high performance teams, they're going for incremental gains, you know, thorough preparation, execution with precision and review. Is this, is this a principle that you see that comes through? What, what are your thoughts on uh, incremental gains and building on little bits day by day? Yeah, absolutely. I think teamwork is the key to it. It's quite interesting that when we start off the test pilot school course, I often say to the students, okay, what's the most important quality of a test pilot? And you'll get the brain the size of a planet, golden <laughs> hands. It's integrity. Uh, and I think integrity, teamwork, uh, and picking on the individual benefits and skills of each person there and, and building it all together, that's the real secret of it. But um, in, integrity is the key. Um, and sometimes there will be an attempt to exert commercial pressures um, and you've just got to resist those. You've got to stay true to yourself. And it's quite interesting in the, having you do something like this for a long period of time. The culture changes. Uh, and I think we've, we've got far more process now than we used to have and far more regulation, um, which is understandable. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But that has tended at times to override the need for judgment. Well, it doesn't say you can't do it. I don't care. The hairs in the back of my neck are up. I'm not <laughs> going to. Uh, and judgment is one thing that is absolutely vital, whatever the process is, whatever the regulation, and people should never, ever lose sight of that. Okay, all right, that's great. Dave, I think that's a good point to, to wrap it all up. I really appreciate your time today. Uh, fascinating stories, and, and I'm sure if we get together over a beer sometime, we could probably talk for hours and hours and hours into the night. Thank you very much for your time. Nice to chat with you, and uh, all the best for your birthday coming up in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you very much, Alex. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope it was uh, enjoyable and entertaining for people. It was wonderful. Thank you, Dave. All the best. Okay, then. Bye. Folks, thanks so much for joining in. It was great. Thanks for your questions. Keep your questions coming. You can post them more in the videos afterwards, too. Remember to share, like, comment, and uh, spread the good word. Until next time, please stay safe.